keep playing. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. What a privilege to be in the presence of God. What a privilege to be in a holy atmosphere like this. Lord, we thank you. We thank you. We thank you. It's been a theme through the night in worship about God being glorified. God being glorified. Put your hand on your own heart and say, God, be glorified through me. God, get your glory out of me. Lift up Jesus through me. Let the world see you through me. Friends, God wants to take us into deeper waters than we've been in before. He wants to open heaven over us in ways we've not known before. He wants to take us to places we've never been before. Lord, we're yours. We belong to you, Lord. Whatever you want, whatever you desire, here we are, spirit, soul, body. We belong to you. Here we are, send us, use us. Oh, draw us closer that we can know you better. Open the eyes of our understanding that we can see you more clearly. Give us deeper revelation to the glory of your Son, oh God. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Lord, there are billions of people who don't know you who've never tasted for a split second what we've enjoyed tonight. Lord, there are people within miles of this building that are lost and hurting and dying. Use us to touch them, Lord. Use us to bring light to them. Use us, Lord, to set the captives free. We ask you, Lord, not just to be glorified in this building, but to be glorified in the streets and to be glorified in the workplace and in the schools and in the places of government to be glorified. Lord, use us to be glorified in the nations and in Israel. May the name of Jesus, Yeshua, be so highly exalted that all we could do is fall on our face in worship Let's just sing to him a little bit more. Let's just sing to him a little bit more. Jesus. playing quietly. Worship team, you just hang out up here if you don't mind, wherever you're comfortable. And you just sit where you are. Stay up front, that's just fine. 
God's laid something in my heart I wanna share with you briefly, but we're just gonna stay in this attitude of worship, and then we're gonna go back to worship, and we wanna lay hands on you, just for fresh impartation, for a deeper working of the Spirit. Friends, God has dreams He wants to put in our hearts. There are impossible things that Jesus wants to do, and he does it through weak, frail human beings. He doesn't want to just use the angels, the mighty angels that can destroy the world in a single blow. He wants to work through people like you and me. And the dreams that he has are impossible for us. They bring us to the end of ourselves. They first put great expectation and excitement inside of us, but then they bring us to a point of complete helplessness because there's nothing we can do in ourselves to do the impossible. And they bring us to this place of complete dependence on God who raises the dead. And then when he does the work, instead of us getting glorified, he gets glorified. And to the extent he's glorified, to that extent people are blessed. So you know the passage. I just want to read some verses from Hebrews 11. This theme has been on my heart all day. And as we worshiped, everything just deepened within me. It says in Hebrews 11 now, faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. This is what the ancients were commended for. It's not just a momentary act, it's our life. We live a life of faith. Everything we did tonight, worshiping an invisible God, that's faith. Every time you take out the Bible to read this as God's word, that's faith. Those of you who are students in the ministry school, that's faith. You said, I wanna be trained. I wanna be sent out to do the work of God. Every day that you say no to sin and yes to God, you are walking by faith. By faith, we understand that the universe was formed at God's command, so that what is seen was not made out of what was visible. By faith, Abel brought God a better offering than Cain did. By faith, he was commended as righteous when God spoke well of his offerings. And by faith, Abel still speaks, even though he's dead. By faith, Enoch was taken from this life so that he did not experience death. He could not be found because God had taken him away. For before he was taken, he was commended as one who pleased God. And without faith, it is impossible to please God because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. By faith, Noah, when warned about things not yet seen, in holy fear built an ark to save his family. By faith, he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness that's in keeping with faith. Look, we're used to these stories in the Bible. But when it comes to Noah, I mean, the whole world, so much of the world knows about Noah. He was just a regular person like you and me, but he feared God and he honored God and he didn't go the way the rest of the world was going. Think about being in the minority. Think of the whole world being against you. But he knew God and he heard his voice and he acted by faith. You know how crazy he must have seemed building an ark? You know how many years he's working on this thing and being mocked and ridiculed? Remember, it's a wicked world. It's so wicked. God's going to wipe out the whole world. But he believed. We don't know the names of any of the people on the earth who died then, but we all know the name of Noah who believed. We don't know the names. Most of us can't remember the names of the 10 spies who told the children of Israel, we can't take the land. It's written in the Bible, but we don't remember their names. We remember the names of Joshua and Caleb that said, we can take the land because God's with us. By faith, Abraham, when called to go to a place he'd later receive as his inheritance, obeyed and went even though he did not know where he was going. By faith, he made his home in the promised land like a stranger in a foreign country. He lived in tents as did Isaac and Jacob who were heirs with him of the same promise. For he was looking forward to the city with foundations whose architect and builder is God. And by faith, even Sarah, who was past childbearing age, was enabled to bear children because she considered him faithful who had made the promise. And so from this one man, and he as good as dead, came descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and as countless as the sand on the seashore. Abraham is 75 and Sarah is 65 when God tells him 
He's going to bless his seed, bless his offspring, and he can't have children. How long does it take before they have children? 25 years. When it's completely impossible. When there's no way he can reproduce. And when Sarah's long since the gone past the point of being able to bear children. That's when God does it. That's what faith is about. Listen to me. Whatever dream God's put in your heart, you will go through a few deaths before you get there. You will go through disappointment before you get there. You will go through seasons where you are utterly convinced it will never happen. Just remember these words. I told you it was coming in advance. Just remember, the Word of God tells us we get to that point. Paul says in 2 Corinthians 1, we thought the sentence of death was on us. We thought it was over. We were in Asia, and we were in troubles beyond our ability to endure, and we felt the sentence of death. That thing where you know it's over. And he says, but this happened so that we wouldn't trust ourselves, but the God who raises the dead. Remember that when you're at that breaking point. Remember that when you're at that point of hitting bottom. This is just where you need to do so that all your trust is in God. This is exactly where you need it to go and be to get to that place of utter human hopelessness so your only hope is in God. And at that point, anything is possible. Here's an old man, Abraham, who was 100 years old with no children. And God says, through your seed, the whole world will be blessed. Who could have imagined what happened through him and through his wife, Sarah, who believed? All these people were still living by faith when they died. They did not receive the things promised. They only saw them and welcomed them. And from a distance, admitting that they were foreigners and strangers on earth. You know, I was thinking during the worship tonight when God spoke to Gord Lindsay to raise up a school. Could you imagine if God said, and 50 years later, the school will be going strong and you will have more than 40,000 grads and you will have 90 schools around the world. Come on, that's crazy. But God's glorified through that. There are things God's spoken to me about over the years that seem completely outlandish, but I couldn't shake it. You say, how do I know if it's really from God? Because the more time you spend with him, the more the fire burns. The more the dream comes up, the more he reminds you of it. And the closer you get to God and the more devoted you are to him, the more real it becomes. We can all have fantasies. We can all exaggerate. People can speak false prophecies over us. But I'm telling you, when God puts the dream there, it stays. And even when you try to get away from it because it's too intense and it's too difficult and it's too impossible and it's too demanding, you go back to worship and there it is again. You know, when God started calling me to start dealing with culture wars and controversial subjects, moral subjects, things that people didn't want to touch, and he started speaking to me to do it, and people were coming to me and saying, old friends, Mike, why are you doing this? Why are you wasting your time with this? Why are you getting distracted from your ministry with this? And we kept doing all the other things we were doing in ministry, but this was added in. And I told them, I feel like an umbrella salesman in the desert. And everyone's saying, Dr. Brown, why are you making all these umbrellas? It never rains here, it's the desert. Dr. Brown, why are you building warehouses with more umbrellas? stocking up umbrellas it hasn't rained here in years and i would tell them i tell them a storm's coming big storm's coming and you're going to need these umbrellas for years now carrying out the metaphor we can't make the umbrellas fast enough because we're right in the midst of things god spoke to me years ago about when he spoke to me just as surely, over 20 years ago, as there was a civil rights movement in America, there's gonna be a gospel-based moral and cultural revolution in America. It's gonna take back ground that was taken through the counterculture revolution in the 60s. And he said to me, you'll be right in the middle of it. And here we are, we could be on the brink of Roe v. Wade, Roe v. Wade overturned after almost 50 years and more than 60 million babies killed. And people have been praying and believing and crying out and impossible things. We could be in, we're right in the midst of seeing 
tides turn, different states turning, eyes opening, parents' eyes opening up. And in the midst of it, I'm telling you, there's going to be a fresh wave of the Spirit in the, in the church. Those who are hungry, those who are thirsty, those who say, we must have God. He's going to come. He's going to come where he sees that desire, where he sees people they don't want to show. They don't want the externals. They want Jesus. They want him glorified. And they say, God, whatever it takes, whatever the cost, whatever the consequence, here I am. Send me, use me. I'm telling you, the Holy Spirit's going to be poured out. Just going to go a couple minutes longer. Then we're going to go back to worship and pray for you. There's a friend of mine on the mission field for many, many years, as average and regular a person as you could imagine, and used in amazing ways by God to win the lost and to raise up missionaries who literally left everything and moved in together to preach the gospel. And that's what they did day and night in difficult areas. And everybody on the team was pretty average. They didn't seem to have any superstars among them. And there was a book about the lives of missionaries that talked about the weaknesses and the failings and the, the hard times. And he loved to read that and give it to his team to read that because it encouraged them like, hey, they were flawed, regular people like us. I told them, I take that part for granted. I like to read the books about the impossible things that happen. I take for granted we're all just weak human vessels. I take for granted that in ourselves, we can't, we can't raise a fly from the dead, let alone bring a soul from the kingdom of Satan to the kingdom of God. I take that for granted. I take for granted that he puts his treasure in earthen vessels, as Paul writes in 2 Corinthians. I take all that for granted. I want to read about the impossible things that God did through human beings. I, I want to read about the miracles that he wrought to the glory of his name through people just like you and me. And when the gifts of the Spirit operate through you, it's not, oh, praise you, it's praise God. It's God is alive. Jesus is really here. This thing is real. You say, what do I do? Just go after him heart and soul. And when you're disappointed, get up and go after him heart and soul. One of our grads in Italy, I saw his post today. He said, I know my failings and my fallings. He said, but when I fall, I want to fall at the feet of Jesus. Lord, everything I have within me belongs to you. That's our heart. Every day of fresh. I'll start many a day and just pray that God be glorified today. Be glorified. I go on frequent prayer retreats and sometimes over the course of the weekend, the, the main prayer over and over from the cry of my heart, not just vain repetition, God be glorified. God, there must be more. God, demonstrate your power. God, work through me. And he's faithful to do it. You'll be amazed over the years ahead how faithful he is. You'll be amazed at the mercy he has. You'll be amazed at the things that he does on your behalf. And just keep running back, Lord. Here I am. Send me. Use me. He wants to put a fresh dream inside of you. An impossible vision inside of you. I started journaling one time. If I was talking to an atheist and they were questioning the reality of God, and I say, look, and I had some debates where I've done this. I'm not trying to convince you. You'll probably mock me for saying this, but I just want you to know why I believe. I just want you to know my own experience. And the more I started journaling, I thought, how in the world could anyone not believe looking at this? The reality and the faithfulness of God. Stand to your feet with me. Remember, we're not looking for the next generation. It's here and now. We're not talking about, oh, 30, 40, 50 years, 100 years from now. We see, no, no, here and now. People are dying here and now. People are hurting here and now. God's name is being mocked here and now. And God wants to use you here and now and in the days and years ahead. And, and obviously, if not us, then who? I mean, here we are saying, Lord, we just want you to be glorified. Here we are. The cry of our heart is to be with him. Here we are saying, Lord, whatever you want to do through me, whether it's public, private, 
whether it looks big or looks small, whatever, here I am, send me, use me. Who else is it gonna use if not for people like that? And in the scriptures, there's a lot about laying on of hands. Hebrews 6 even mentions it as one of the foundational doctrines. Simon the sorcerer in Acts 8 saw that the Holy Spirit was given through the laying on of hands. And Paul talks to Timothy about gifts being imparted through the laying on of hands. So I've been with you, I think, five different months since late last year in this. I don't remember doing this at any point, but just felt prompted as we come to the end of the semester and for everyone that's, that's visiting, just this meeting here in May, that we pray for you, lay hands on you. And Josh and Toby, I want you to come on up. Most of you met them earlier today, directing our missions department, helping those that are called to the mission field get on the field, connecting them with people we have around the world. They've got some literature still, if you're looking for it, we ran out earlier in the back table. But we wanna pray for you, and then Pastor Adam, any others that, that you wanna bring in to pray, and we'll just, just step out from where you are, right? So fill the front aisle, step out. If you want prayer, if you don't want prayer, just stay where you are, that's perfectly fine. But we're just gonna circulate and pray for you, all right? And these are safe people. If they feel the Lord saying something through them, they'll say it to you. You test it, but they're, they're people we've worked with over 25 years. And you may feel something, you may not, but I believe God's just gonna plant something afresh. Just add something, give you something, impart something by His Spirit. And there, there are people we had the privilege of training and sending out that are literally reaching millions today. And others whose names we don't know making an incredible impact in many other ways. And what we have in common is we poured into them and got to lay hands on every single one of them. So we're just gonna go back to worship and when we pray, just receive. You don't have to strive or anything. Anything you saw or just wanna share? You know, we believe in the impartation of the Holy Spirit to do more. Our greatest cry during revival was more Lord. Mas fuego, Señor, mas, mas. Are you with me? And you know, a couple of months ago, I was, we took a trip to Cameroon to be with our people there. And you know, scripture says, young men see what? Visions, old men dream, dreams. I'm still a young man. I see more vision clearly than I've ever dreamed. And asking God, what do you want us to leave there when we go there? And I saw Jesus he had this match in his hand. It was about like this. It had a head on it like this. And he's standing on his throne and he struck this thing across heaven and he put it in my hand. And he said, I want you to be a match to light the fire of heaven under a thousand evangelists in Cameroon. And at the end of that day, I simply did what I saw and the place was set on fire literally on fire and in tonight this worship woo, if you don't have heaven in you now we need to talk to you afterwards but what I saw I said Jesus what are you showing me this for now he said take the match take the match and he said strike it across this floor and I saw the fire of heaven begin to burn just burn brilliantly across this floor and when I see these things, when your feet begin to burn, you're gonna know the fire of heaven's touched your feet. And when you feel the heat of God coming over you, you're gonna know he has touched you in a very special way tonight. And then I, I just kept listening, and I'm, I'm, I'm gonna quit here, but it's just what it's on my heart. How many of your first name it starts with a C? Let me see your hand. It starts with C. Anybody up here? It starts with a C? All right, here's what I felt like the Lord said. He said, I'm gonna give you an additional identity. And it's the letter C. It stands for carriers of his glory. And when we pray for you tonight, I am believing that God's gonna strike something inside of you you've never had before. And you, for some reason, he just said the letter C. And then I said, carriers of my glory. Just what you were talking about. 
You know, when we, we pray for thousands of people, we don't have to give you a personal word. We trust God to touch you and do the ministry himself. We don't have a whole lot to give, but we can touch the presence of God here in this place, and we've already been there. Amen. So, Lord, we receive from you. And once again, our lives are living sacrifices on your altar. Send your fire, burn afresh in us. In Jesus' name, thank you, Lord.